Hi, I'm Michael Halpern. Thank you for joining me today as I do some thinking out loud. Our first segment is called Background Briefing. The first thing I've been thinking about is the mixed messages coming out of Washington. Support Israel, but we do not like what you are doing, so we're going to pressure you by slowing down the supply of weapons until you do what we ask. Quite frankly, the hypocrisy and the holier-than-thou attitude of the United States towards Israel is truly infuriating. The U.S. Pentagon recently announced that last year, on May 3rd, 2023, they mistakenly killed a civilian. It was not just a misguided errant bullet that killed the civilian. The United States had tracked a 53-year-old shepherd in northern Syria with a highly sophisticated Predator drone. And then they launched a Hellfire missile that blew him to smithereens. Now, the Hellfire missile is a guided smart bomb. It's not a very big one. It's about five feet long, but it costs a ginormous amount, about $150,000 a missile. The Predator drone, however, is huge. It's 28 feet long, and the wingspan changes between 48 and 66 feet, depending on which Predator. Turns out the United States tracked a simple shepherd named Lufti Hassan Masto, thinking he was an Al-Qaeda leader. They were wrong. A year later, after, quote, a thorough investigation, unquote, the Pentagon admitted their mistake. Oops. It was a very expensive mistake, not just a monetary loss, but also, and perhaps more importantly, in credibility. It makes clear that the United States, too, makes mistakes. The United States, too, kills innocent civilians in war. Of course they do. Deaths of civilians is, unfortunately, a part of the cost of war. The fog of war is what the United Nations calls it. Good nations don't target innocent civilians. Good nations like Israel and the United States try their best to minimize civilian casualties. And yet, while at the same time that the United States is openly admitting their mistake, albeit a full year later, they are crucifying Israel, the pun is intended here, for civilian deaths. Crucifying Israel for what the Pentagon euphemistically terms collateral damage. The infuriating part is that the United States admits that they do exactly what they are asking Israel not to do, a pure case of do as I say, not as I do, military style. And please do not think for even a moment that the United States accidentally killed only a single civilian. Yes, on that day, yes. But according to a piece published in the British paper, The Guardian, on Tuesday, September 7th, 2021, the United States is responsible for killing at least 22,000 civilians, including as many as 48,000 since 9-11. The subtitle of the piece is figures based on reported numbers of U.S. airstrikes highlight the human cost of the 20-year war on terror. Here are some examples. August 29, 2021, in Kabul, Afghanistan, the U.S. flubbed a drone strike killing 10 innocent people, including seven children who were fleeing the capital. The Pentagon took months to admit the mistake, insisting that the car was loaded with terrorists and weapons, which was the reason for the huge explosion, not the missile that they hit it with. In the end, the car was actually carrying a family of one of the U.S. helpers in Afghanistan and the helper himself. The United States mistakenly killed him and his family. Months later, on November 4th, the Pentagon termed the deaths an honest mistake, quote unquote. In September of 2019, the United States targeted the Taliban and instead hit a wedding party, killing at least 40 civilians. In Syria in 2019, the United States mistakenly attacked and killed dozens of women and children. The list goes on and on. Mistakes happen. One report I read brought the total innocent civilians killed by the United States via drone and missile strikes to 140,000. That's probably an exaggeration. I could not prove that one way or the other. But nevertheless, the numbers are huge. In January of 2022, the Pentagon pledged to be more transparent about these mistakes, which is why we're hearing about them now. No doubt that is a good thing. It also clearly points out that the United States and the Pentagon know full well that Sometimes innocent civilians are hurt in war, and yet they are not offering the same understanding to Israel, and that's what's infuriating.
Actually, the United States is refusing to extend the same understanding to Israel, period. The other country that has, by all other accounts, set the gold standard for civilian death ratios. Instead, the United States persists in publicly chastising Israel for civilian deaths, knowing full well, as we all do, that Hamas hides behind civilians and civilian institutions like schools and mosques and hospitals. Knowing that Hamas uses their own innocent civilians as human shields, more than simply a double standard, the constant haranguing of Israel by the United States over the deaths of innocents, the accidental deaths of innocents, the unavoidable deaths of innocents during wartime, constitutes what I consider an immoral and unjustified attack on an ethical army that is doing its best to prevent civilian casualties. And that's the, that's the bar, doing their best. The IDF is doing its best to prevent civilian deaths, even to the point of often endangering their own forces. And the United States knows that full well. So while I applaud the Pentagon for admitting that they mistakenly killed the Syrian shepherd, I just wish they would apply the same standard to Israel that they apply to themselves. But for now, that act of understanding and global recognition doesn't seem fit for the agenda. It's more than infuriating. It's a little shameful, too. Coming up next, points of view. This column is from the Wall Street Journal, and it was written by Seth Cropsey. This column was published way back in March 27th, 2024, and it is still correct, as relevant and interesting today as it was when it first appeared several months ago. The column is entitled, To Thwart Iran, Fight a War of Attrition. Subtitled, Israel and the United States should focus their strengths on Tehran's weaknesses by jeopardizing its proxies. Cropsey's thesis is that wars are won by attrition, but the United States and Israel do not like attrition. They don't like wars of attrition at all. Iran, however, is in it for the long haul. This is how Cropsey begins. The tensions between Jerusalem and Washington demonstrate that neither understands the situation. Israel needs to learn to fight an attrition war against a much larger adversary, Iran. The United States must accept the strategic requirements of its regional partner, despite the politically driven drivel offered by President Biden, Senate Majority Leader Chuck Schumer, and a Congress that refuses to act. Failure to grasp the conflict's fundamentals will lead to bad policy and ultimately calamity. Cropsey identifies Iran's overall goals, which are kicking the United States out of the Middle East, eliminating Israel, and creating a situation in which Iranian leadership takes over the Muslim world. Cropsey is uh, of the conviction that Iran plans to achieve these goals through attrition by slowly manipulating their proxy minions. He writes, Iran's objectives are expansive, the elimination of American regional power, and the destruction of Israel to clear the path for the Islamic revolution's ascendance throughout the Muslim world. It means, however, are relatively limited. Iran lacks the high-tech weapons to take on the US and Israel directly. The axis of resistance, its proxy alliance, spanning the Levant and Yemen, lacks the cohesion or capability to conquer Israel. Iran's strategy is long-term attrition, it hopes to keep the U.S. and Israel under continuous military stress through Hamas pressure in Gaza, the Houthi attacks and international shipping. Iran patiently accumulates operational advantages by building up forces in Syria and Lebanon, squeezing Jordan and driving the U.S. from its handful of Levantine bases. A key is the al tanf complex in Syria, which constrains Iranian logistics and help shield Jordan from Iranian pressure and smuggling. By creating interlocking strategic dilemmas, Tehran can make it impossible for Jerusalem or Washington to resolve the confrontation with a brief high-intensity operation akin to the 1967 war or the 2003 Iraq war. Iran hopes to compel Israel and the United States to turn on each other, leaving both isolated and vulnerable. But according to Cropsey, all is not lost. Cropsey has a plan 
for both the United States and Israel, and this is his plan. Countering Iran will require tolerating more risk, yet even American willingness to hit back against Iranian harassment of U.S. bases wouldn't yield a swift, straightforward result. Iran would counter, leading to an extended conflict. An extended conflict is all but guaranteed at this point. Now, in order to succeed, the United States and Israel must attack Iran at its strongest points, and that will require striking its minions. Now, I go back to the column. Israel and the United States need to put Iran's strengths at risk. Their most effective approach is to jeopardize the axis of resistance, replacing it with actual direct Iranian control over the Levantine powers it employs as legal shields. The Axis's greatest benefit is that it provides the power of an imperial entity with very little of the cost. While Lebanon's Hezbollah handles essential governing tasks in the country's south, no Axis member formally controls the state. Lebanon, Syria, Iraq, Yemen all exist as legal entities. Thus, they are responsible for the basic costly tasks of civil administration, such as providing public services, setting economic and social policy, and maintaining public finance. Now you see, Iran holds the money strings and guides the leadership of their proxies. So Israel and the United States must act. They must attack the arms and the leadership of Iran's proxies where they are. They must degrade Iran's ability to attack Israel through their proxies. The column continues. Iran provides financial backing to its Axis partners and in Syria, Lebanon, to the states themselves. But Tehran still outsources the burden of actual governance to these states, which increasingly lack control over the territory and exist primarily to reduce Iran's direct burden and maintain the fiction of sovereign independence. Israel and the United States have tools to strike Iranian military capacity in Syria and Lebanon. This is the operational decisive point of Iran's campaign, not Gaza and Yemen. Despite the public focus on Hamas and the Houthis, the United States and Israel can rapidly degrade state capacity in Lebanon and Syria, forcing Iran to assume direct control of both territories or to shrink its defense perimeter to Iraq, thereby essentially abandoning its ability to pressure Israel and the United States in the short term. In conclusion, Cropsey explains that winning means totally degrading Iran. Winning means that Iran can no longer sponsor or influence any of the actors in the region. Cropsey writes, winning the Middle Eastern war means ending Iran's existence as a regional threat. It requires accepting the current conflict's fundamentals, specifically understanding that the attrition is the only coherent paradigm to apply. The risk is that absent a real grasp of the challenge they face, Israel and the US will talk past and at each other while both fail to develop an effective strategy. This is a very big goal, I say. It's essential to winning the war against Iran. Coming up, commentary through cartoons where pictures tell the story. I want to show you seven cartoons. No memes, no headlines today. Just cartoons. First up is a cartoon in which we see Bibi Netanyahu and the Ayatollah of Iran sword fighting. Below them is a fiery pit Above them, broken tree limbs, the tree limbs that they had been climbing and clinging to in an effort to prevent their falls are now broken and in their other hand. And the leader of Israel and the leader of Iran are now falling down the cliff. They are still sword fighting on the way down. Next up is a cartoon that depicts the United Nations airlifting food to Gaza. We see ragged and hungry Gazans with their arms raised hoping to catch the food as it tumbles to the ground. But behind them is Hamas, coming out of their wrapped tunnels, holding clubs and beating the hungry Palestinians. Now a cartoon poking fun at pro-Hamas demonstrators and their ridiculous demands on campus. Written on the green shirts worn by the demonstrators is the phrase, Hamas rules but rules is misspelled, R-O-O-L-S. The protesters are opening their aid packages. One protester shouts, no bagels. We clearly listed no bagels in our care package demands. The infidels must pay for this. A second protester shouts, no respect for gluten intolerance peace. The third shouts, no. That's funny. 
<laughs> Next up is a cartoon of someone holding a Palestinian flag chasing another person carrying an Israeli flag in front of a statue called Alma Mater. The statue has an open book on its lap and its hand covering its eyes. Sad but true, kafir wearing Muslims, Marxists, are chasing and frightening Jews on campus. Now a cartoon that depicts the reality of our world today so well. A world in which campus protesters know little to nothing about what they are protesting and about what is really happening in the Middle East. In this case, a protester holds up the sign that reads, We are hummus. Those three words say it all, much better than even the university students claiming, We are all Hamas, which is funny in and of itself also. Under the cartoon, the caption reads, it soon becomes apparent that some students needed to know more about the subject of their protests. How true that is. Next up are two students walking across campus. One protester, a man wearing a keffiyeh, is holding a sign that reads, Divest Now. He turns to the other person, a woman wearing a simple backpack, and says, I'm majoring in mob rule. Finally, this last cartoon, of the week offers a bit of Musser. Musser is when you teach a fundamental lesson that make people better people and improve the world in the process. The cartoon is composed of two panels. The first panel reads, just because you want to stop this, and beneath it is a tombstone etched with the word Gaza. The second panel reads, doesn't mean you can do this. And then a sign which reads, anti-Semitism. How true, profound even. In a moment, more of my own perspective and a few predictions. Hezbollah claimed responsibility for a recent rocket attack aimed towards Mount Dov, or Har Dov as we call it, which is located on the border between Israel and Lebanon. They announced that the rockets they sent are new, heavy rockets which they have named Jihad Mugnia. The name of the rocket is significant for Hezbollah. Jihad Mugnia was a Hezbollah commander killed in an airstrike in January 2015 in southern Syria. Hezbollah blames Israel for the airstrike and for his death. He was the commander, a devastating terrorist commander. Meanwhile, Hezbollah has scaled back its presence and its fighters along the borders of Israel, and they started to use more drones. The strategic shift is aimed at inflicting more damage on Israel's forces and assets while minimizing Hezbollah losses. A source within Hezbollah terror group explained the new strategy in the course of an interview with the Lebanese newspaper al Diyar. According to the news report, Hezbollah has been withdrawing operatives from the front lines while maintaining surveillance and reconnaissance units there. The source also explained that the strategic shift is focused on launching Katusha rockets and medium-range missiles with increased reliance on drones launched from the border area. These weapons are difficult to track because of their speed and maneuverability. The source also said that Hezbollah has enhanced its intelligence capabilities, primarily through the use of networks of agents, spies, operating from within Israel. If that is true, it is extremely worrisome. U.S. forces in the Gulf of Aden in the Red Sea intercepted missiles fired at them by the Houthi rebels in Yemen, according to a report from the U.S. CENTCOM. IDF has opened a new humanitarian aid crossing into the Gaza Strip in coordination with the United States. The crossing is called Western Erez. It was opened in the northern Gaza Strip area in order to transfer humanitarian aid, especially food, water, and medicine. Pro-Israel anti-Hamas vandals sprayed graffiti over a $3.4 million Brooklyn home of James Carlson. Carlson, who lives in Park Slope in Brooklyn, is a wealthy professional protester, often nicknamed Richie Rich. He's a protester who demonstrates for Hamas. He was discovered amongst Hamas protesters at Columbia University, has been arrested several times. According to a report in the New York Post, the vandals sprayed James Carlson's home with stars of David and the phrase 710, in other words, October 7th. The phrase, never again, was also written there. We've been thinking out loud about a lot today. 
Now that you know what I've been thinking, let me know what you're thinking. Email me at micah at jbstv.org. Tweet me at Micah Halpern. Tell me what you think. Before we end, let me leave you with one picante piece of information. Did you know that Israel has won fifth place in the Eurovision Song Contest this year? Eurovision is a cross between the Super Bowl and television's America's Got Talent. A highlight of European life, Eurovision is an annual song competition run by the European Broadcasting Union. All EUB members and associate members can participate and complete, compete. Performers are chosen to represent each country and their songs, their performances are voted on by people watching from their homes and an official panel of in-studio judges also judge. Given the situation, especially Israel's war with Gaza, the fact that Israel placed fifth place is truly spectacular and is telling about what the world really thinks about Israel. Even more spectacular is that while Switzerland won the competition, Israel beat Switzerland in the popular vote of 275 to 265. Israel has won this competition four times. The most famous win was with the song Hallelujah. Which was later made famous in the United States when sung by Jewish husband and wife team, Steve Lawrence and Edie Gourmet. Last year, Israel took third place. I'm gonna sound it like a unicorn out here on my own. I got the power of a unicorn. Don't you ever learn? And then I'll pull it back. I'm pulling down. I'm going up. You better turn out the power of a unicorn. The power of a unicorn. You wanna see me dance? You wanna see me dance? Yeah, you wanna see me dance? <laughs> Watch me. This year's song is entitled Hurricane. It was performed by a 20-year-old singer named Eden Golan. Hurricane is a song about October 7th and its aftermath. Before approving the song, Eurovision's judges asked that the lyrics be adjusted in three places to make it less political. The song 
Eden's voice, the choreography, are truly remarkable. Not surprisingly, there were large protests outside the presentation hall and even booing inside after Eden Golan sang. But there were also cheers and great applause. Eden Golan has become an Israeli hero, even at the age of 20, an Israeli icon. She carried herself with grace and honor and brought pride to Israel, despite the conflicts and the attacks around her. This is the music video of the hurricane, not the actual performance. I think that this video conveys the message even more effectively than the live performance. That's why I chose this. I'd like to point out also that there was an, another Israeli who performed, unbeknownst to many people, who performed in the Euro Eurovision contest. Her name is Tali Gallagant, and she represented Luxembourg. Tali was born in Jerusalem and is now studying music in New York City. She was also in the finals. And now sit tight as Eden Golan performs Israel's entry in this year's Eurovision, Hurricane. Ladder of my symphony, play with me. Look into my eyes and see. People walk away but never say goodbye. Someone stole the moon tonight Took my light Everything is black and white Who's the fool who told you boys don't cry? Hours and hours and powers Life is no game but it's hours while The time goes wild Every day I'm losing my mind Holding on in this mysterious Living in a fantasy, ecstasy, everything is meant to be We shall pass but love will never die mm. Hours and hours and powers, life is no game but it's ours Why? The time goes wild Every day I'm losing my mind Holding on in this mysterious ride Dancing in the storm I got nothing to hide Take it all and leave the world behind Baby, promise me you'll hold me אפילו אם קשה לראות, תמיד אתה משאיר לי אור אחד קטן. I hope you found this as powerful and as beautiful as I did. The music, the words, the dance. What a wonderful tribute to the victims of October 7th. Thank you for thinking out loud with me, Micah Halpern. Let's think out loud again next week on JBS.